thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, one of the reasons I was interested in doing it was because the students uh, who organise this program will be the generation uh, to which we hand this country and they'll determine its future. And I, think it's, I think it's important that we talk about that. So I'm going to talk about their task, um, the one that they will inherit from my generation and for purposes of today, my generation means the baby boomers. I missed out a little bit, but I mean the baby boomers. So, overall it's not a good story, in my view, uh, but I don't tell it to disillusion or demoralise, but to set out that it's not just the fine thoughts of, and the idealism of the young that will make this country better than it is now. Um, it is the unflinching will to keep seeking solutions to the hard questions through all the ups and downs and stages of what come to be often busy lives. So this is a story about a need for a strong will. It's a story about a need for strong leadership, for goals and for passion, patience and persistence. So to the story. Nearly two years ago, I delivered the Henry Parks Oration in Tenderfield in the very hall uh, where Parks gave the speech that was credited with turning sporadic murmurings, murmurings as they were at the time into a coherent movement to federate the otherwise fractious and independent uh, colonies of the Crown. Now, I wish I'd learned more about Australian history, but that wasn't a lot of my generation. We learned British history, um, much more than we did Australian, so I came late to the efforts of Parks and his colleagues, Deacon, Griffith and many others. But as I marvelled at what they did with trains but no planes and no automobiles, and not even an iPhone or a Twitter account between them, I wondered how they'd meet the challenges that face uh, their federation today. It's no longer about hard borders, customs posts and, and military uh, 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 forces. It's uh, not even about railway gauges. That took a while to be settled, but it's been settled. But Parks wanted more. He wanted a great federation and he went into bat for it. He made that clear in the speech in Sydney in 1891 when he spoke of one nation, one destiny. Remember, one nation, one destiny. He said that he wanted the people of Australia, and I quote, to repose in peace, union, freedom and prosperity forever. The leaders of that time chose to call us a commonwealth, a word that was derived from the ancient common weal, meaning common good. Cogent argument, careful narrative, combined with persistence, patience and passion, won the day for the common good over short-term political and often vested interest. In their own way, many of my parents' generation wanted a similar, uh, sim uh, pursued a similar course. Like their parents, they'd lived through a Great Depression and a World War, and they didn't want that for their children. They wanted us to have a better life, and importantly, life in a better country and a better world. So how did we do? Did we take advantage of the opportunities not available to, to parks, to my grandparents and my parents? Did we build something better, not only for ourselves, but for the generations after us? So if we explore it a little, I'd start off by saying I think we started well. Many of my generations are idealists, but idealists with a purpose. We knew what we wanted to do, and we thought we knew what needed to be done. I was reminded of that particular period just the other day when I was listening to the radio and I heard about the reproduction of the musical Hair, first performed in 1968. The so-called rock musical that defined a genre and arguably a generation tells the story of a group of politically active hippies of the age of Aquarius, which astrologists, that great science, the astrologists described as, and I quote, that time when humanity takes control of the earth and its own destiny as its rightful heritage. The musical was set in New York and the hippies were after a very practical outcome. They wanted an end to conscription for the Vietnam War. Now in my generation we weren't all hippies. Um, I don't think I knew anybody who used uh, pharmacological enhancements and not so many of us uh, could sing, although we did wear flared trousers. But many of us were otherwise like the characters in the music idealists with a purpose, and like them we most certainly did think we should take control of our future. One of the heroes for many in my generation, uh, 
a different US president from the one we just heard about, John Kennedy. He summarized the objective in, the, in, in his so-called peace speech in June 1963. He said, and I quote, so let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, he said, in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet, we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's futures, and we're all mortal. So many of us in my generation took all that to heart, those sentiments. We lived the Cold War, and the, as the nuclear stockpile built, uh, and we knew fingers were twitching over the button, we knew we had to change that. We heard of the horror of the Korean War, and we saw the violence of the Vietnam War on our newfangled televisions. And it was obvious to us that war, with all its brutality, was not the way to solve differences. So we knew we needed to change that. We saw environmental degradation, we saw development at all costs, as if finite resources were infinite, that their exploitation came at no, with no cost. We knew that wasn't true, and we knew we had to change that. We saw the need for improved levels of uh, social infrastructure, including support for wide, widely accessible education and health care. We had to do better than we were doing, we thought. Many of us were deeply concerned about poverty, inequality and other forms of social disadvantage, and we knew we had to be better than we were. We saw the plight of Australia's Indigenous peoples and we knew we could fix that. So we tried in our own way, from music to activism. There were demonstrations here and abroad, sometimes huge, always loud, occasionally violent, sometimes useful, sometimes not, and rarely popular with the establishment of the day. And we didn't forget the importance of politics. We made clear at that time what we expected of our political leaders, and some may even have listened. A recent poll indicated that politicians of that era are seen now to have been more thoughtful and more responsive than the present lot. But first, that wouldn't be hard to do, and secondly, uh, that might just be the rosy glow of hindsight. But we changed. As the idealism of our youth uh, gave way to busy lives and the comfort of middle age, could I honestly say that we changed the things that needed changing? Did we build a better country in a better world? A country and a world that was safer, one that was more secure, peaceful, tolerant, equitable, prosperous, fair, civilised, civil. Now, of course, many things are better. Uh, in many respects, we were a lucky generation. We got the advantage of the so-called post-war boom. Unemployment was low, and even if you didn't finish school, you could get a reasonable job. There were more opportunities for us to get an education. Healthcare got better. Some diseases of my youth have been or were effectively eliminated in Australia and in large parts of the world. Going to the dentist became less traumatic. But we are better educated. We are better educated than our parents on average. We do have better gadgets to make life easier. From our cars, our houses, our microwave ovens, our mobile phones and our credit cards. We are or can be more informed than them, though not necessarily better informed. The world is now there for us to see, to read, to hear about, using all sorts of connections. We can know what universities in Berlin teach, we can know the temperature in London, or find out the depth of snow in Aspen just before we jet off on our holiday. So yes, many of us are more comfortable than our parents could ever have been, but is the world better? Is Australia better? If we were to judge by outcomes, and to be honest with ourselves, we would have to conclude that too many of my generation left behind their idealism and their pursuit of practical outcomes to the big challenges well before, well before their hair turned grey. So if we look at a few examples, these are my examples, you might have different ones and you might think I'm wrong, but I'm here and you're there. <laughs> so, take the environment. You don't have to be a scientist to see what's happening. For example, roughly half of the Great Barrier Reef, roughly 50%, is now dead or seriously damaged. Largely as a consequence of too high a sea temperature for too long, plus cyclones and storms. 
we see the Arctic, the Antarctic and the Greenland ice cap all responding exactly as you would expect of a planet that's warming. In July alone, in one month alone, Greenland lost a net 197 billion tonnes of ice. In the unit that we all understand, roughly 80 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. And that was as a consequence of a particular weather event sitting on top of a warmer, climate, a warmer planet. In June, in one month, there were more than 100 wildfires north of the Arctic Circle. There were wildfires fires in 11 of 49 regions in Russia, with the biggest in Siberia. We know the impacts of climate change are already being felt in agriculture and food production, to biodiversity, ecosystems, water resources, human health, human settlements and migration patterns, energy transport and industry. We know from the United Nations that the global rate, and I quote, of species extinction, extinction is already tens to hundreds to, of times higher than it has been on average over the last 10 million years. We know that many species can't evolve quickly enough to adapt to the rate of change in the natural world. And we know with a high degree of probability that all of this is happening because the globe is warming. And we know that it's warming largely because of what we humans do so that some of us can continue to live our more comfortable lives. Burn fossil fuels, clear vegetation and make concrete, for example. And what do we do? Still, we bicker. Poverty is still with us in Australia and elsewhere, one example. We set our support for the unemployed at $40 a day and say it's OK because it's temporary a transitional arrangement to support the search for work. We actually know, for the hundreds of thousands of Australians, it's not temporary, and if it is transitional, it isn't in any reasonable time frame. In March 2018, ACOS reported that 54% of recipients had received unemployment payments for more than a year, 44% for over two years and 15% for more than five years, but we want to believe it's their fault. The problem will get bigger, the number of older recipients is growing by about 10,000 per year. And we know that it takes roughly twice as long for somebody aged over 55 to get a job 67 weeks to get a job than it does for somebody younger. But it's OK, we're told. We don't need a plan. We don't need a strategy. Even to talk about it, to talk about increasing new start is to talk, and I quote, unfunded empathy, according to the Prime Minister. But tax cuts are OK. Move on. Inequality is still with us. We still see pay differences between women and men and lower superannuation balances for women. Women can be anything up to 20% behind in pay in a sector and 34% in superannuation. We know it's harder for women over 55 looking for a job than it is for men of the same age. Why? Because they're women. There is inequality in access to education and access to qualified teachers for women and for men depending on where you live. It's a lot easier to get decent access and qualified teachers if you, live, if you live in the city, but not if you live in the bush. And likewise, access to health care. One people, one destiny. The list goes on and still we shake our heads and say it should be better. Wealth disparity, I'll end the list soon. Wealth disparity uh, is increasing in Australia. An ABS analysis uh, showed last year, showed high wealth households, earlier this year, showed high wealth households increase their average net worth from 1.9 million in 03-04 to 3.2 million in 2017, a good 1.3 million. Over the same period, low wealth households increased theirs by less than $1,000, 1.3 million and 1,000, the difference. The gap between the two is now the greatest in decades in our commonwealth the common will, the common good. Move on, we say. No need to discuss that. We still see life's outcomes for Indigenous people way, way below what most of us in this room would tolerate if it were us or if it were ours. And still we argue. Forms of military adventurism or brinksmanship continue, even after all of the lessons that history teaches us. Think Iraq. Think Afghanistan, think the Persian Gulf, think the Korean Peninsula again or still, 
and now wonder and worry about Hong Kong. And still we send young men and women off to the other side of the world to fight. Now, on a more positive note, one of the positive things that my generation did do was to use treaties to reduce the nuclear stockpile from a high of 70,300 warheads in 1986 to a much lower number now. In fact, there are only 14,000 nuclear warheads in 2015 distributed amongst no fewer than nine countries. And when you think that it would take one cobalt bomb to wipe out all living systems on the planet, I don't know how many of the 17,000 are cobalt bombs, but it is uh, 14,000. But there are 14,000 warheads still available, 4,500 operational in the world today. Nine countries, more fingers hovering over the buttons than ever before. And to be generous, you'd have to say some of them are unpredictable. So, I think that while it's unarguable that uh, life, certainly in material terms, is better for many of us, overall the planet is possibly in even worse shape than it was before we took it over. Partly because we've more widespread and more sophisticated ways of doing harm. And a lack of empathy, and a lack of, uh, of action where and when it's needed. So maybe we should ask the question of whether there is a point at which the planet can no longer support the manner in which so many of us, to which so many of us have become accustomed. Or not so much whether, but when. And we don't ask the question. So, as Simon asked earlier, how have we let it come to this? Uh, clearly we lose the urge for change. We get comfortable, and it's okay. We become selfish. We become a country where privilege morphs into entitlement very, very quickly indeed. And you can never take away or reduce entitlement. Ask us oldies. We know how to hang on to everything we believe we've earned. Ask politicians who are invariably able to operate within the rules they write, no matter how much, no matter how it looks from the outside. They don't get robocalls. We hear our political leaders tell us that it's unfair to sustain today's lifestyle by running up deficits that coming generations will have to fix. I accept that, that's probably true. But the very same politicians want to burn or sell fossil fuels to sustain today's lifestyle, even though we know that the coming generations will have to fix a different sort of debt or a different sort of mess, the planet we leave behind. So I believe we have to do better, and I've got plenty of time to tell you how. If I could speak for my generation, uh, I would apologise for what we haven't done, or what we've left only partly done. And then I would apologise for something we did do. Allow the so-called trust deficit to grow to the point where there is little confidence that our leaders and our institutions will do the right and honourable thing. Their behaviour may have caused it, but we let it happen. Justice Hayne of the Banking Royal Commission fame recently commented, commented that trust in all sorts of institutions, governmental and private, has been damaged or destroyed. He suggested one reason was the opaque and the skewed decisions of, quote, politicians influenced by those powerful enough to lobby governments behind closed doors. Our federal government is now trusted by just 31% uh, of us. 31% of us trust the government. Ministers and MPs rated just 21%. Well, more than 60% of us believe that the honesty and integrity of politicians is low. Our trust in democracy has fallen from 86% 86, 86 in 2007 to 41% in 2016, 18, sorry, 2018. An essential poll from September last year showed we had least trust in political parties, 15%, trade unions, 25%, religious organisations 29%, federal parliament 25% and business groups 29%. It's a pretty big trust deficit when you want some of those people to lead this country in the ways that Simon was talking about earlier and I will talk about similarly in a minute. We need people to do it. And we need people who are willing to do it and we need to keep them and hold them accountable. So, what we do though, is too many of us turn off, we disengage. 
So roughly, as you all know, we have a compulsory voting system in this country. Um, last election, last federal election, roughly 2.2 million of us did not bother to vote or voted invalidly in the last election. Approximately 1.5 million registered to vote and chose not to. And personally, I think that's uh, appalling that we would do that. And it's because we do that that some of the things that I described earlier have been allowed to happen. So we don't trust them, we change them. And that's what I'm talking about. What do we do? To start with, I think we've got to own the problem. It's our problem. It's no excuse to say it happens elsewhere. Look at America, look at Britain, look wherever you like. It happens there, so why wouldn't it happen here? It happens here because we let it here, not them. So we have to own it. And it doesn't follow that because citizens of any other country see the sensible ground that we should too. We have to choose leaders who understand what it takes to lead. Simon gave you some, might have similar, courage, critical, vision, important, persuasion, tell us why what they want to do is important and why their vision is worth adhering to, worth accepting as a legitimate future for the country. It's what we have to do. And then what we have to do is we have to hold them accountable for what they say they will do, for what they don't do, and for what they don't want to do. To earn our trust, to earn our trust, you have to earn it. You don't get it because you hold a job or a position or you're Prime Minister. You don't get trust because you hold a position. You earn it. And as Justice Haynes, the same one, also said, it has to be more than political rhetoric that now resorts to the language of war, seeking to portray opposing views as presenting existential threats to society as we know it. And I agree, the process has got to be better than it is. But if you think about it, what is it? What it does is, it climaxes in a three-yearly ritualistic smooching, badged with a commitment to Australian values that is signified by an Akubra. They don't go out there and say, this is the country we want to build. They tell you, we can't have a deficit, so we'll cut everything. It's about priorities, it's about courage. So I was saying, you have to have people with courage who are prepared to go out and lead and to persuade us that they're leading us in the right direction. But they don't. Their jobs are more important to them than taking the country where it could go in what is, of course, a pretty uncertain world. So the process has to be better. Uh, so am I pessimistic after that long list? Am I, do I think? There is a future, that there is one possible. Yes, I do, because there are students like the ones here today who are going to take over from my generation, and they're going to do better, and I'm sure they're going to do better. They know that the way this plays out is up to them, and I know that what I said could confuse and concern, but properly led, properly led, we could see creativity, we could see optimism, we could see appetite for change. Where we, the people, if I can coin a phrase, where we, the people, decide that our dreams will define our country and its place in the world and not some drift because we've not been properly led, not been properly talked to, not gone through a process where we actually engage to get leaders who will take us where we believe we want to go. So to the students, that means when it's your turn, you've got to engage. The sad thing about the last election campaign was that a lot of the young people that had registered uh, to vote in the gay marriage plebiscite did not vote in the federal election. I thought it was going to be a game changer in the federal. I thought there were two odd million who didn't uh, elect in the one that uh, Malcolm Turnbull won by a seat. Um, but then there was a whole influx of people from the younger end of the age spectrum. And I thought, oh, this will change things. Then, then by majority, they didn't vote. And that's more important, because the ones who are most satisfied with the status quo are my generation. And it makes no sense for my generation still to be determining in the way we do how this country heads off into the future. The younger ones have got to engage. And you can be disillusioned. You can think 
you beat your head against the wall and they don't listen and they're more interested in their own jobs and keeping their jobs and all the rest of it. True. But until we engage to change it, it will stay like that. So I have optimism. I have optimism that the young people of Australia will have values, they'll have principles, they will have the courage to stand by them, they'll have the education to be able to articulate them and to persuade the rest of us that it's worthwhile and a good direction for us to go. So my advice is to you, acknowledging that it's not easy, my advice to you is be brave, take control, engage. Because it can be done if you want to do it, if you want to do it enough. And remember Henry Parks, passion, patience, persistence. You need all three to win. And you've got to be patient because it takes time. If there's no passion, what are you selling? And if you think getting angry once or getting pressure once is enough, you're wrong. You've got to go back and back and back and keep fighting the fight. Because if you don't, then our future is not rising. If you do, our future is. And I'm within time. So.